Hello, I'm Marwan. I'm Devin. And welcome to The Wasteland and the Mountain, where we discuss the state of the left, analyze where it's gone awry, and together envision a path forward from the wasteland and towards the mountain. Uh, this week, it is just Devin and I. Phoenix is uh, traveling internationally, and it is about well into the night for him now, so he could not join him, but he, but he will be joining us next week. And uh, quickly, as a disclaimer, we would like to clarify that the thoughts we share and the opinions we espouse are our own and not representative necessarily of any organization to which we may belong. It's June 5th, and you are listening to Episode 5 of The Wasteland of the Mountain. In our prior episode, we introduced Peter Camejo's ideas on the general orientations found commonly on the left, that of liberalism and ultra-leftism, and their relationship on the countervailing political force of mass action. We explored these categories and what they mean for both Camejo and for us on the left today explaining how liberalism is fundamentally hostile to the socialist project of building a class-rooted organizational body, which perfectly represents public interest and the general will of working people. How ultra-leftism often presumes for itself a distance from liberalism that doesn't hold well under scrutiny whatsoever. And finally, how independent mass action notions of political organizing and base building deliver us from the narrow, circular, navel-gazing, and dead-end organizing modalities of liberalism and ultra-leftism. Today, we explore Ramsen Cannon's article entitled Ultra-Liberalism, the Dominant Tendency of the American Left, written uh, in February 7th, 2022, considering with each other as to what it illuminates for us in a similar vein as Peter Camejo's 1970 speech. So in reading and discussing Ramsen Cannon's article today, we hope to achieve a great sense of appreciation and understanding about the landscape, currents, and ideologies on the left, as well a greater sense on how to navigate these differences so that we may inspire confidence and clarity in leftists already committed to the cause of winning for the working class. We hope to help listeners become more effective towards the goal of uniting advanced leftists, advanced leftists to the common cause of liberating the working class. We see overwhelming unity and solidarity amongst all good faith advanced leftists, socialists, Marxists, etc. as a critical condition to meet for moving forward a counter-hegemony to the ruling class hegemony of liberalism, conservatism, and all other ideologies friendly or amenable to the status quo domination of the few over the many. In this regard, we will be going over a general high-level summary of the article, and in doing so, we will use various jumping-off points as open invitations to meander a bit and discuss before returning to keep on course encapsulating this profound and richly dense article on the status quo of lifestyle leftism today, i.e. ultra-liberalism. Yeah, so I'll start out here. Um, Camejo actually gives a very good uh, summary of the entire article in in his, um, the very first part, part one. So I'm just going to read this out here. So, you mean um, Cannon? Oh, did I say Cameo? You did. It's all good. I mean Rams and Cannon. Yeah. Uh, so, so Cannon starts the article with clear and um, unequivocal assertions at the state of the left in the introduction of his article. So he states, The dominant politics of the left in the United States is a form of liberalism, a superficially radical liberalism that gets its political logic from the nonprofit industrial complex. As the concrete conditions of U.S. society and the dysfunction of mainstream politics make people hungry for answers further away from the center, this form of liberalism allures them. It is familiar because of its liberal nature, but it is also seemingly much more radical than mainstream politics. 
However, this politics is not a break from the consensus liberalism of the U.S. state. It is merely an incrementally different type of politics, which keeps many of the same premises of U.S. liberalism, just in a heightened form. This ultra-liberal political tendency keeps the liberal hostility to power and authority, preserves the emphasis of individual moral worth, grants and withholds political personhood and political agency, and maintains its intolerance towards socialist mass organization politics. The ideology of ultra-liberalism is often invisible, just like the consensus of U.S. liberalism and its political practice comes from the nonprofit industry that arose in the last quarter of the 20th century. While the practice of ultra-liberal politics has benefits in dealing with bourgeois institutions, it is destructive for the socialist project. It rests on the policing of personal identity and on constructing communities for the purpose of monopolizing power and breaking up uh, sol- solidaristic politics. It is in this way essentially elitist and therefore hostile to mass action socialist politics. As part of the liberal spectrum that makes up U.S. politics, it will be incapable of fundamentally changing social relations in the United States and will always prove itself much more effective in policing, undermining, and disciplining radical socialist and revolutionary politics. Brat. I mean, damn. Cannon just really lays it out in that introduction Mm -hmm. so clearly, so fundamentally. And honestly, that is just so consonant with my experience from like joining left organizations, um, which isn't to it, which isn't to be like uh, to decry them too much. These are kind of things that have always been barriers that needed to be overcome. And just because there, these barriers are there shouldn't, shouldn't discourage anyone in some overwhelming or existential way. It is a barrier that must be overcome. And in fact, by kind of analyzing articles like this, that's exactly what we hope to do is to kind of overcome these things. But to go Mm -hmm. in blind and not understanding these dynamics, it can feel completely discouraging. It can feel completely overwhelming. And certainly I uh, I have, you know, had to deal with a lot of really excellent, thoughtful, comrades in the struggle just you have to step away because they're kind of overwhelmed by the dynamics that canon touches upon here you know like personal like the policing of personal identity that's a dynamic that's super pervasive you know like the kind of disingenuous and kind of superficial construction of communities instrumentally for power that modality is very familiar and it's ever present in spaces i've entered in participated in on the left and you know i'm even if people don't have a way of like formally rendering the critique theoretically like people are just kind of instinctually aware that whatever this is whatever these modalities are even if they can't put a name to it it's just there's some it feels like bullshit and it feels totally antithetical to the ostensible goals that the left has of solidarity and unity so I'll leave my comments there. But yeah, yeah you, I, you know what you just said reminded me of um, it's a meme that the right th- th- they used to push it back. I think this might have been 2016, 2017, but I believe it was it was a national convention for the DSA, and the video clip was of I think it was this guy who would stand up and and while while the um the meeting oh, was like information attempted. exactly yeah, yeah. Our, our point point of personal privilege yeah point of personal privilege yeah that was like i think that was the 2017 convention and uh, yeah yeah or it might have been 2018 but but yeah it became a bit of a meme and <laughs> please continue no i was just gonna say yeah like that that sort of that dynamic it's 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 funny because the right poke fun at that and it's it's perfect fodder for the right, but also you know the left understands that as being extremely detrimental, you know, to to the socialist project. And uh, you know, Kame- uh, Kameho, I keep saying Kameho, <laughs> Cannon really really spells this out, you know, quite perfectly as to you know as to the reasons for this, and 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 gets in, into detail like why that's the case and why it's detrimental to like mass socialist politics. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you're right. You know, that was kind of like fodder for like the right and people online going, oh, look how stupid the left is. And you know what? Frankly, um, it, it, the thing that was kind of unfortunate is people looked at and they kind of used it to just throw the baby out with the bathwater on the whole yeah. project. But even in that same fucking room, there were like leftists who still were showing up at that convention in good faith to do the work of advancing, you know, pressing resolutions that would that could be healthy for the DSA. And, mm -hmm. you know, they have to kind of deal with these situations with the best grace they can muster at the time. But right. like, but don't think that they weren't sitting there rolling, rolling their, their eyes, eyes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. even though they couldn't show it outward, you know, like just grinning and bearing that sort of thing. I guarantee you there was a lot of people there who had that same, you know, like that same kind of like, um, uh, you know, uh, difficulty dealing with that level of tedium and and just like kind of concern trolling and, and so on and so forth. Right. Like someone someone in the convention brings up a, a, a great point of discussion and then someone gets up on the mic and goes, can you please stop using gendered language? And then like half the people were probably just rolling their eyes like Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's like when somebody does that it's like it's not even specific what the fuck they mean so it's really just kind of a way of throwing a wrench in the a spanner in the works and mm -hmm. just kind of know that you know um it's yeah. nobody's there to be like malevolent or malicious but when that can when someone like lay levels that kind of concern trolling it's like even though people don't want to get into it right there and and, and point out how disingenuous that might be it's just like, oh, can we just get through this fucking resolution? We have a tight agenda today, you know, and right. it's just it's this t level of tedium that um, it's very unfortunate. But people, yeah, like I think this the the amazing thing about this article is that it gets into some of those dynamics of like what's actually happening behind all that, right? So yeah, please uh, continue on that final paragraph of the summary and then we'll continue from there yeah so the last paragraph uh canon says it is a powerful political practice one that undermines the socialist goal of mass participation and politic politicization of the working class to see itself as a class and to act for itself as a class that reinforces liberal forms of white supremacy and will ultimately re regress to more mainstream forms of liberalism when pressure is applied to it Socialists should recognize ultra liberalism as dominant and as latent in most radical politics. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, um, Canon kind of implores us to like recognize this, to, to bring it to the level of consciousness. So, so that it doesn't just kind of, um, dominate us from like the, from the invisible beyond, you know, where we can't mm -hmm. speak to the dynamics, we can't speak to the mechanics, because by kind of identifying the mechanics of this phenomena, it, it, the potential for it to kind of control our our discourse and the way we move forward is greatly diminished. And you know, I think in that spirit, that's where this kind of article is going. You know, and so, right? Oh, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, yeah, it's like with with ultra liberalism, it's it's. It's so um, it's so pervasive, and a lot of people like they know that there's something wrong with it. They just can't put their finger on it. Like going back to that that 2017 DSA convention, you know, like even like people on the left were like, "All right, that's a little absurd, and it seems counterproductive." But like they they can't quite put their finger on why that's the case. You know, they might have an idea of why that's the case, but yeah, it's it's through understanding the the mechanics of it and like defining it and and properly understanding it that you can really start to challenge it um, just through understanding it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Well said. So, uh, jumping in, you know, that was that was the intro to Canon's article, and it was a banger. You know, part two. You know, Canon kind of. Uh, maybe text 
takes a step back and kind of entreats us to look at liberalism as the consensus U.S. ideology. And so in the second part of Cannon's article, he goes on to make a clear case about how the overwhelming ideology of the United States is liberalism, drawing an interesting spectrum range of liberalism ranging from left forms like progressive liberalism and modern liberalism uh, to centrist forms like neoliberalism and tending more towards the right historical forms of classic liberalism. Cannon makes a key passing assertion that the two-party system maintains the ruling class hegemony by housing competition between these various liberal tendencies, often leaning on identity markers to keep people bought into these small identity tendencies within liberalism. And, um, uh, you know, we have a question here uh, to kind of get into some conversation. Why has liberalism fumbled to define who counts as a political person? And how does the fuzzy nature of political personhood manifest in today's climate of liberal identity politics? And Devin, you had some thoughts. Yeah, I, th I think it's it's best to first distinguish what canon means by liberal. And this is something that we touched on um, in our last episode about Kameho's article. But um, to recap, liberalism, you know, in, in the way that Cannon is talking about it, isn't necessarily referring to liberals as a social category in today's culture wars. Like liberal, li liberals as a social category um, overlaps with the liberalism Cannon is talking about. However, he's not necessarily talking about like blue haired chicks with septum piercings who talk about dismantling the patriarchy or whatever. But by liberalism, you know, he's referring to the various flavors of the political philosophy known as liberalism. So, um, as you mentioned before in, in, in your summary, you know, this category, um, uh, in this category, you have progressive liberalism, neoliberalism, and classical liberalism, and so on. So all in all, um, liberalism as a political orientation, it has to do with individual liberty, you know, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the right to property, um, uh, market economics, and, and so on. And this is enshrined in the two-party system. So in other words, in the United States, both Republicans and Democrats both deal in various flavors of the liberal project. So... In the abstract, um, liberalism, you know, having to do with fund uh, with individual liberty is fundamentally a negative liberty project. So, in other words, it views the individual's relationship to greater society as being fundamentally at odds with individual rights. You know, like we've all heard this, like don't don't tread on me, get off my property, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, that sort of thing. Like it's about freedom from external conditions imposed on you by society. Um, and, and liberals um, don't seem to understand the enlightened position that it's only through society and through an individual's relationship to society that an individual can, can thrive. So in other words, humans are social beings and determine themselves as, in, uh, as individuals only insofar as they are social beings. And, and the social relationship between individuals. And um, uh, Cannon, he actually quotes Marx uh, on the subject of liberalism. Um, Marx said, uh, liberalism leads men to see other men not as the realization, but the limitation of his own freedom, which is a very profound statement, I think. Um, so... So the issue with liberalism and its its emphasis on individual liberty is that it isn't willing to look to practical and realistic structural solutions, you know, to ensure that everyone has these idealistic inalienable rights. And and um, you know, we'll, we'll eventually kind of get into that when when we start talking about um, you know the liberal uh, distrust of power and authority, but. Um, but yeah, so it, in the absence of, of, of strong state intervention, you know, where individuals would become universally recognized as persons within a strong liberty state, which is every liberal's worst nightmare, what happened is that there's this um, attempt at mitigating the issue of political personhood through like a series of, of small civil rights movements to recognize groups that 
have been historically mar- uh, m- marginalized, like like blacks, indigenous peoples, and and so on. But the key thing to note here is that the state apparatus itself, you know, it being the author of all of these woes in the first place, isn't to blame. What needs to happen is a series of reforms, like ultimately leaving the same structural issues in place that led to the uh, the problems of political personhood in the first place. So one thing that I've, I've noticed and that I found interesting is that this, this emphasis on political personhood has kind of reached a fever pitch in the United States, you know, like with the rise of, of uh, postmodernism and in like, you know, postmodernism's disdain for absolutes and like any fixed notion of identity, you have like this, um, uh, this splintering effect in which people atomize themselves like into minority identity groups, all looking for recognition, uh, normalization, and political personhood. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, a lot to go on there. Um, but, uh, you know, Cannon gets into those tendencies more in the article. Um uh, but yeah, I, I think without saying it, and, and you rightly point out that uh, there's a big distinction between the liberals' conception of like freedom to be kind of left alone, a, a sort of a negative form of liberty, and yeah. this this idea that you know, and and and, and Cannon points to that Marx quote, and you pointed out, and you read it off too, uh, about like seeing your freedom kind of represented like in struggle with the other yeah. as being more of a positive form of liberty. I, I think you're absolutely right to point out that liberals do not possess that enlightened kind of understanding of, of liberty. And that actually a lot, a lot hinges on that. Um, mm-hmm. And that will be kind of more clear as we keep summarizing the article and we keep making comments. So uh, continuing on here with the summary of the article on the right, Cannon paints a picture of the competition liberalism has between illiberal ideologies like dominionist theocracy from the religious right and overlapping strains of Trumpian ultranationalism and even fascism. On the left, the competition to liberalism, according to Cannon, are various socialist formations. Cannon asserts that generally the right has been significantly more successful in seizing the machinery of mainstream politics on account of the interplay between these politics and significant sympathy and funding from ruling class bourgeois like Trump, Peter Thiel, Elon Musk, and the Koch brothers, and many others. Conversely, much of the socialist left's success depends on a strong relationship to organized labor, which on the whole, since the late 1970s, sharp decline in national union density has largely collapsed. And um, and I just want to jump in and make some comments here. Like effe- effectively, to continue on this point, there isn't really funding of class conscious left orgs that occurs. You know, I think the right tends to hystericize about George Soros, and you know, they would say <laughs> like, you know, the, the George Soros is funding the Marxist left, and yeah, know, and it's right. really they, they they just call liberals fucking Marxists. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's just it's a lie it's a bald-faced lie no fucking billionaire is funding the marxist left you know not not, to, right. not that i've ever fucking heard of anyway um, yeah marxist billionaires are um a kind of a contradiction in terms yeah i, I mean you know like <laughs> I, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sit, sit here and assert that there aren't wealthy people who might have some degree of class consciousness. I mean, Engels was one of them, for God's sakes, uh, yeah. Marx's close compatriot. But this is a very rare scenario, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and you know the exaggeration and just outright lies that the right peddles about, you know, quote unquote car- cultural Marxism. It's their inability to actually disaggregate and distinguish between various social cultural and ideological forces in society yeah. that that and they do it on purpose for as far as they're concerned people actually disaggregating these sort of things does not does not jive with their convenient narratives 
it, 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 you know, if people actually had a level of nuance in this sort of thing, they would probably fall, not fall for the rights, just absurd narratives, you know? Yeah. So. I, it reminds me of um, the, the Zizek Jordan Peterson debate, which I wouldn't even call it a debate because yeah, I mean, <laughs> it wasn't much of a debate, just more of them just talking. Yeah. But uh, it reminds me of, uh, of when Zizek started talking about cultural Marxism or, or I think Peterson brought up cultural Marxism mm -hmm. and Zizek was like, where are these Marxists? Like, show me these Marxists. I, I don't see any of them, you know, it, yeah. it, it, just the idea of cultural Marxism is just, it's just so ridiculous. Really what it, there is, is cultural capitalism. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's the real, uh, pernicious underlying force, you know, yeah. and cultural some, liberalism. A, and cultural liberalism, you know, not this absurd notion of cultural Marxism. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just like, um, it's like a bunk concept that nevertheless just gets a lot of traction. People just keep repeating it. People should be calling it out every time they hear it and, you know, exposing the people who trade these, these silly notions, uh, for the empty garbage they really are. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and so to continue on with those comments, like at most, like some liberal million billionaires may fund centrist liberal media, uh, think tanks, and political campaigns, entertaining progressivism as long as it is wholly untethered from formations and organizations who advance a class analysis. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, that's that's the most you'll see rich people do. And, and and they're clever enough to really know who is advancing class analysis and who's just, you know, playing woke with no class analysis whatsoever. Because as soon as yeah. there's a class dynamic and class consciousness and uh, and and you know, putting forward the 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 contradictions of these class dynamics, a billionaire is not going to be interested in funding that because that fundamentally threatens their their position and hegemony in society. Right. So, you know, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, and this gets into later on in the article when he talks about like, you know, the left cutting, cutting its ties from the labor movement and then also wedding itself to the, you know, the nonprofit industrial complex where you have, you have this situation where you have these, um, you know, these, these, uh, these left, you know, formations, I guess, if you want to call it that, that really they don't pose any threat to the ruling class because they're the ones who are funding it. It's either like they're funded by government grants who of course aren't going to fund anything that's, that's in the slightest bit revolutionary. And then you have, you know, then you have the billionaire class that's, that's funding that are funding these, um, these, these organizations. And of course they're not going to fund anything that threatens their interests. So yeah, I mean, this is something we'll get into later, but yeah, it's just a uh, it's just a sad state of affairs. Yeah, absolutely. So, getting back to summarizing uh, part two of Cannon's article, Cannon argues as well that liberalism's overwhelming loyalty to notions of the legal sanctity of the individual ensures that it remains essentially a negative liberty project. And a uh, quick aside, like Cannon doesn't use the term negative liberty, but uh, as we've clarified it, that's essentially what he appears to mean. You know, balking at the systematic, structural, and universalist policy changes that have real hopes of transforming social relations, often reflecting a fundamental fear of power and the coerciveness of institutions to stymie or threaten the individual. This is discordant with much of the rhetoric liberals often proffer and begins the and brings the working class no closer in, in achieving meaningful equality of opportunity, let alone redistributional policies that directly benefit working people. In further managing these contradictions, liberals appoint themselves managers to the ostensible claims towards the interests and representation made by various subsets of people seeking political personhood taking it upon themselves to manage the political personhood of varying groups, especially those making overtures to liberal consensus politics. This capitulation can be understood as respectability politics. Devin, you had some thoughts here? 
Yeah, I just, you know, before reading this article, I had never heard of, of the term respectability politics. Like, I, 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 um, I, I knew what it meant because I've, I'm familiar with what it means, but I've never heard the actual term respectability politics. So, you know, with respectability politics, it's this idea that, like, you know, a, a, a minority group in order to fit in with a majority group. So like a minority group yeah. that's oppressed in order to fit in with a, a majority group has to um, adopt uh, whether that's, you know, behaviors or, or, or forms of speech to fit in with the majority. Um, like for instance, you know, like blacks will, will, will speak in, in front of white people will, will with less like, um, you know, like black vernacular and, and Ebonics and that sort of thing just yeah. to fit in with, with, white coworkers or whatever. Um, but one thing I noticed too about respectability politics is that um, I've noticed that there's a sort of, uh, there's been a sort of inversion of, of respectability politics in certain cases where it's like, instead of the minority, um, and instead of the minority, like adjusting themselves to fit in with the majority, there's this tendency to uh, cause the majority to normalize some some something or some aspect of of a, of a minority group, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like I not think... across the board, but you yeah. know, it, it's like, for instance, uh, what's it? What's a good example? Um, you know, like like with um, like with gender ideology, where it's like. You know, everybody is. There is no such thing as gender. Everybody's a little bit gay or a little bit. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. And it's a it's a power tactic to normalize their, you know, their minority uh, stance and make it something that is is normalized. If mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, trying to you know, like the, the, the kind of like woke gender ideological vanguard, like making people use like pronouns that like, honestly, aren't even like Z, Zer or like, Oh uh, yeah. You know, like these like Sim, Xer with, with an just, X. Just honestly, like stuff that it's hard to count it as anything but nonsense. But yeah. But there's like this forceful kind of um, kind of assertion that like these have to be accommodated to, otherwise you're doing a fascism or 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 mm -hmm. you know uh, your job should be under threat or you're being a problematic person or or oof, that person did this, or you know, like all the, yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It, compelling people to kind of like capitulate to this extreme. And I feel like that's that is, it's still fundamentally liberalism. It's just like this, the, it's like a certain heightened form of ultra liberalism that does try to invert respectability politics, but yeah, you know, um, but by kind of inverting the formula there, it's not really, it's still just kind of playing by the same logic. It's just reversing it. It's not really threatening the liberal hegemony at all. You know, yeah, and you know, I'm I'm not trying to rubbish respectability politics in general because there are cases like, for instance, um, you know, like blacks when they're getting job interviews, you know, like they are they're gonna they want to talk more like middle class white people so that they can get jobs. Like, there's obviously there are there are issues that that respectability politics you know um, addresses, um, unfortunately, so. But it does, I have noticed that it has kind of been inverted by like, just, yeah, like you said, just ultra, you know, ultra liberal, like woke identity politics stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, respectability politics was kind of big in the Obama years. I, I would say like Obama was a big advocate of uh, respectability politics with like his speech on fatherhood at the early part of his like uh administration um you know it was very much this bill cosby like you know uh as 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 black people we need to be more present you know 
as fathers and stuff like that. That was like, that was a very much a respectability politic speech. Oh yeah, to totally. Kind of clarify that for people. And, you know, I think it does have some social merit in some broad strokes. Yeah. But, you know, um, uh, I, I wouldn't call it necessarily, uh, like there is some, there is some like general rationality to it, but it doesn't, it just kind of, it just kind of entreats people to hold fast to the status quo. It doesn't really do anything to address the iniquities of, of the status quo. And so right. in that sense, I, I, I consider it generally reactionary, you know? Um, yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, so continuing on with the summary of the article, this principle is also echoed in the extolling of the liberal faith in a dubious meritocracy that formal uh that formal education uh is representative of one's political value uh canon provides a good example in the liberal establishment argument that cash is speech um among the liberals insisting on tolerance even of the profoundly intolerant i.e tolerating hate speech meant to terrorize marginalized people Cannon makes a key observation that ultra liberals extend this logic by stating, quote, ultra liberals merely take another step along the same spectrum. Instead of wealth or playing by the rules, it is in degrees of suffering or privation, end quote. And Devin, I think that speaks well to, to what you were talking about with respect to respectability politics. Um, you know, because respectability politics, it is about playing by the rules. But right. with ultra liberals it's it's about your position and your sort of clout uh in playing this kind of uh what's it called like uh oppression olympics and suffering mm -hmm. patient you know right um, so stating further that ultra liberals make the error that by inverting the classical liberal form of rating personal personhood i.e. property equals personhood, they will achieve a just and equitable society. Cannon states this is disastrous for the socialist movement. In the latter section of part two of Cannon's article titled Liberalism, Power, and Democracy, Cannon speaks more to the negative conception of freedom that liberals hold fast to, stating, quote, Liberal, liberalism is characterized by hostility to power in the abstract. The liberal precept is that power and authority are themselves the cause of human misery. The source of oppression, freedom is understood as the absence of power, end quote. And I think, Devin, you had some, uh, uh, some comments here as well. Yeah, you know, we've, we've touched on in previous episodes about <clears throat> the left's uh, distrust of authority and power. But anyway, that the quote that you just, you just read, um, you know, uh, not freedom, uh, with this part, uh, liberalize liberalism is characterized by hostility to power in the abstract. And I've, I've found that to be so true, um, amongst liberals, like a buddy of mine, he's a, um, he's an anthropologist at, uh, UC Riverside in California. It's a PhD student. And we got into this this debate once about cultural appropriation, and um, my my you know my stance in the argument was that cultural appropriation in general has been how societies have changed and evolved over time. You know that's how civilization civilizations change. That's how you get you know a great civilization like like um, like Roman civilization or like you have Alexandria like cultural appropriation isn't a bad thing per se right but his whole his whole stance was that cultural uh, appropriation has to do fundamentally with power relations right so for instance if you were to wear an indian headdress that is cultural appropriation because you were appropriating something from a group who has less power like as a white person you have more power and privilege than someone who uh, indigenous who does not have that power, right? Or like, mm -hmm. um, if you are to appropriate something from Chinese culture, whatever it is, like you're, they are currently 
like we're white people are still the dominant power and and while the chinese are not even though as we all know that's slowly <laughs> that's definitely changing that's probably it's not going to be the case for, right now frankly right exactly but uh what's interesting is so i brought up the point i was like okay so when chinese tanks are rolling up fifth avenue can we culturally can you technically culturally <laughs> okay appropriate now? from the chinese <laughs> and he said yeah no that's totally fine because they're they're the dominant power now <laughs> so really it's just a it's just a demonization of power is what it is it's a complete demonization of it it's like it's this idea that power itself is like a negative thing in the abstract <laughs> he said that's totally fine <laughs> Yeah, he said at that point it's totally fine because so when the yeah. Chinese tanks are driving up Fifth Avenue, I can make a joke about their their driving ability. According yeah, to exactly. Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, no holds barred, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. Yeah, man. Um, cultural appropriation is is like I, I've heard that logic before, but it's like. I, I I don't know. It, it, it's 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 just it just it's it's more like policing the boundaries, mm -hmm. and it's not really even about understanding the world in a more thorough way. Like I, I you know I don't think I've ever felt like I've been illuminated by somebody like badgering me and policing my discourse and invoking the phrase cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. you know, it's usually just been a total buzzkill. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it totally. It kills the mood, and, and and it's like, oh, nobody wants to actually have a thoughtful discussion anymore because someone threw that card out, you know. And also, like, if you play that card, it's just the logic immediately breaks down. You know, it's like <laughs> if you want to take it, you know, to the nth degree, you could be like, well, why are you listening to house music? You're you're culturally appropriating that from black people. Or why are you listening yeah. to why are you listening to punk music? You know that was that that has its origins in in blues music, which is cultural appropriation. <laughs> yeah, it just like breaks down. It's like everything's fucking cultural appropriation. Right. And before you know it, it's like you you can't do anything, you can't have anything, you can't fucking say anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, it's it's right. just it becomes absurd, totally yeah. absurd. Yeah. No, I mean it, it it's it's um it's absurd pretty quickly off the jump just like you say it starts breaking down pretty quick absolutely um well continuing on with the uh kind of summary of part two canon corroborates this assertion and and devin you you cited this quote earlier canon corroborates this assertion with thoughts from marx in his critique of liberalism wherein marx regards regarding the liberal conception of freedom as the absence of authority quote leads man to see other men not as the realization, but the limitation of his own freedom, end quote. Cannon asserts that this notion holds securely, albeit in different degrees across the liberal spectrum. And I think he's absolutely right to point that out. Because again, liberalism, it, uh, it, it fundamentally, whether it's in its progressive or quote left forms, or in its like kind of right wing forms, it, it holds... Um, holds these notions kind of in unity that like uh, the individual's relationship to the whole is a tenuous and kind of dubious one that, that should entreat our skepticism and, and mistrust. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, also, it, it, go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, it's just individual liberty is sac sacrosanct. Yep, exactly. Yep. Cannon also makes key observations around the irony of how liberals' commitment to democracy is abstract and presumably a bit tenuous, stating that liberalism tends to focus on rules and formalities of democracy rather than sustained and actual democratic practice. Liberals make overtures to democracy in as much as it pertains to accountability and transparency and the and the focusing on the factuality of rules being in place. Cannon also asserts that liberals are satisfied to consider meaningful democratic representation as satisfied not from the mere fact that individuals possess the choice and the option 
to participate or 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 or, or, or satisfied from the mere fact that individuals possess the choice and the option to participate democratically. In other words, the systematic failure of entire swaths of people in society to participate in democracy and therefore be represented is of little consequence or meaning and is no major cause for con- concern, let alone a damning reality in which to account for. And um, to kind of phrase that another way, like, again, the disenfranchisement of people to to your average liberal is like something they rarely want to focus on um, because as long as they have the choice or the option or they can take time off work, then the system is still functioning. The fact mm-hmm. that let's, let's even say the percentage is like 60% of people are not voting. Well, you know, as long, again, as long as they have the option, you know, in theory, but really in practice, then, you know, the liberal will count that as like a, a success. Also the kind of, liberal like um obsession about like rules that also it comports with like my experience in the dsa a lot of people who are like in like the rules committees of various groups in in dsa uh ironically enough are from like the anarchist persuasion <laughs> anarchist <laughs> obsessed with rules. I mean, like what's going on here <laughs> well, you know when you understand anarchism is a kind of extension from liberalism it starts making a lot of sense yeah 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 the 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 old liberal to ultra left pipeline yeah absolutely absolutely so canon ends part two of his article with a very key point regarding the congruence with ultra left political conceptions and ultra liberalism more broadly namely that the liberal tendency to focus on consciousness raising slogans right thinking and demonstrating moral conviction is all in line with the liberal modality that liberals are eager and happy to substitute effort into pushing forward an organized political instrument which broadly represents the working class for the idea that raised consciousness will be sufficient to transform society stating even more unequivocally that this is one of the major reasons there is such outward harm, harmony between ultra-liberal politics and more orthodox left communist and anarchist politics, just like we were just saying. Quote, because ultra-liberal hostere, hostility to formal structures of power and belief in the cumulative effect of raised individual consciousness can be mistaken for left communist and anarchist theories of the erosion and abolition of the state. End quote. Yeah, that that goes back into what we were just talking about that the the liberal to ultra left pipeline, and I it just reminds me of of all the people in twenty twenty who were who were just liberals like voted for Hillary Clinton like two seconds ago, and then all of a sudden they're online like you know posting communist memes and and you know like anarcho communist memes and following and reposting anarcho communist pages. And that sort of thing, and and what I really loved about that this part of the article, and, and is just understanding why that's the case. You know, why is it that 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 liberals? Why is there this liberal to ultra left pipeline? And it's because they just have this, like you know, um, like you just quoted. It's like the belief in the cumul- cumulative effect of raised individual consciousness can be mistaken for left communist and anarchist anarchist theories of the erosion and abolition of the state which i found very fascinating yeah absolutely absolutely and um you know this is a big tangent but i I just feel like this is a time to assert something that i've thought for a long time like in 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 marx like you know the withering of the state you know in communist theory when everybody has achieved like a a certain kind of uh enlightenment state that institutions will like de-necessitate themselves. I mean, this is like Chomsky's version of anarchism as well. Mm -hmm. Has always seemed like to me just kind of like a dubious thing, like a throwaway line, because even in Marx's time, he was like organizing with a lot of anarchists and he probably just figured out this is a way to get them appealed to, you know, what communism means. (laughs) Like, I, you know, I, 
I, I, I, I'm not con I'm not convinced like that, that made him in anything, anything like an anti-statist, but nevertheless. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, that makes, I, I, I think I agree with that. It's like, he was such a rigorous thinker that like, I can't believe it's hard to believe that he would jump to that conclusion, you know? Yeah. In any meaningful way. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so yes, that brings us to part three of the article, cutting labor ties. Devin, you yeah. want to take this one? Yeah. Let me take off here. Um, okay. So in part three of Cannon's article, he illustrates the conundrum of the modern left being largely divorced from the labor movement and the knock on effects. This is generally on the left's ability to succeed, arguing that, and I quote, the practical connections made the political logic of the labor movement. Uh, let me start that, start that over. The practical connections made the political logic of the labor movement, the political and organizational logic of the broader left, because the labor movement was the engine in terms of morale, vision, funding, and personnel of other movements on the left, end quote. Framing the issue, Cannon speaks to the rather objective nature of the political pro project or political logic of the labor movement. Being built up from the concrete realities of shop floor organizing, the challenges around how to organize the people present doing the actual work on location. Cannon also goes into the historical conditions which, which lead to the erosion of the connection between the organized socialist left and the labor movement through McCarthyism, the Cold War, and the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, which purged communists from union office and institutionalized the labor movement, which made it more congruent with the conservative political mainstream and away from the broad left politics. Quoting loosely, uh, and I quote, this leads to a, this led to a general loss of the militant labor minority. The general purge of socialists and leftists from union leadership and the marginalization from the rank and file labor layer of labor instituted labor's cooperative turn towards management, the Democratic Party, and their hawkish Cold War policies, and thus turning young radicals off of labor, end quote. Cannon argues that as union rates plummeted, the nonprofit NGOs, non-governmental organizations, filled the enormous vacuum left by this cutting of ties of the left from labor, resulting in a left that took on a dramatically different character, analytical premises, and political logic, which was that of the nonprofit industrial sector. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this is um, where we're going to kind of end our episode. Um, but this notion of like, the left cutting its labor ties, I think Cannon makes a very strong case that this that uh, this vacuum that was left is part of the big reason why we get this kind of liberal leftism, this mm. hegemonic liberal leftism of today. That if it wasn't for this cutting of labor of labor ties, we would actually have a leftism that is a lot more consonant with the socialist and class oriented left of, of before, like mm -hmm. before, like the kind of 1970s, uh, and the new left period. Um, and we're going to get into that more in, in following episodes. There's really a lot to say there. Um, but one thing that Cannon doesn't talk about that we've kind of touched upon in previous episodes is, also the kind of ascendancy of postmodernism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think um, that is, you know, that gives a lot of cultural landscape and dynamism to uh, to like left liberalism yeah. um, that that isn't really accounted for here because I think Cannon's making a very kind of materialist argument in analyzing like the cutting of labor ties on the left, which is totally foundational, frankly, I, I think it's mm -hmm. absolutely apt, but, yeah. but the other end of that is like the cultural, uh, uh, foray of like academic leftism. And I think postmodernism is, is heavily represented in that, in that realm. Yeah. So I think they both work in tandem to, 
to bring us to the very solid, sorry condition of the left today. Yeah, totally. It's like there's this there's this there's this emphasis on this like postmodern all paths and all truths um, sort of outlook that characterizes the left. But really, I, I, like what I really love about this article is that he he um, he really grounds it in in like a materialist analysis, i.e., you know, the breaking off um, the the left breaking ties with the labor movement. And I think that's a really important puzzle piece to kind of make sense of all of this. And it's not that like, you know, it's not being reductionist. It's just, it, it really does help inform the reasons why the left is just sort of like this free floating standalone, like nebulous, uh, like cultural force, you know, yeah. as opposed to it, as it was in the past, being a concrete historical, um, you know, movement tied to reality and tethered to reality. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. Really well said. Yeah. Um, you know, class analysis, a la what like Canon does in this article and what others do should not threaten the kind of dym- dynamism of like various ideological conditions or cultural forays and, and and it shouldn't it shouldn't threaten that level of analysis in fact they, they should comport with each other if they're both rational and and i think considering both of those elements are are really a key to really know whether your analysis is on track you know mm-hmm. um yeah so that said uh i would like to thank all of our listeners for tuning into episode, I believe that was episode five, right? That's what episode, episode five. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we are ending our critical exploration of Canon's article here before returning next week's next week to cover parts four and five. And after that, we will conclude by examining part six, six and seven of Canon's article in our final episode in this particular series. Cannon's article is very dense. It really covers a lot. So we felt it necessary to divide it up into three parts. Um, listeners, I'm sure you will understand. And hopefully this will just kind of help people navigate and plug through this, again, pretty dense and illuminating article. So that said, this has been The Wasteland and the Mountain. We are signing off. Thank you for tuning in again to our fifth episode Please subscribe and join us for future episodes. We'll be diving deep into the concepts, ideas, great intellects, and thinkers of the class conscious left. Thank you and good night.